Welcome to CMR Interviews by Jason Shapiro. In today's episode, Jason Shapiro interviews Anna Duke. To find out about Jason, visit www.crowdedmarkettrayport.com. And to learn more about Annie Duke, visit her website www.annieduke.com and subscribe to her Substack newsletter. All right. Hello, this is Jason Shapiro with CrowdedMarketReport.com. And today I am really happy and really honored to say that we have gotten Annie Duke to uh, to join us um, for, for a conversation. And um, I would say as a background, if you don't know who Annie Duke is, then you're probably in the wrong place. But let's just say what I how I knew her was, you know, she was a very successful poker player and like many people, after the whole sort of Chris Moneymaker blow up in, uh, in poker, I started to watch a lot of poker. And um, and he was uh, was one of the stars of the show. And I would have to say that one of my favorite, if not my favorite moment in all of those TV shows of poker was when uh, was when she won the, the Tournament of Champions. And I just thought it was so good because not only was it a woman that kicked ass against all these completely, you know, egotistical men, but, um, you know, and we're talking about this. This was against the greatest poker players alive. I'm just looking at it. You had Helmuth on there. You had Howard Letterer, who I think is your brother, right? That's true. Uh, Johnny Chan, Greg Raymer, Doyle Bronson, Daniel Negreanu. I mean, Phil Ivey. Chip, these are, Chip Reese. Right? I mean, these are, you know. Uh, yeah. Th- th- these are the people, and, and she beat them all. But what was even better than that to me was, I always thought when she won, I still remember this and I haven't seen this in in 15 years. She was the the joy on her face when she won on TV was was, was just amazing because you see these guys win a lot of these tournaments and like their attitude a lot of times is like, oh, I was supposed to win. You know, what am I going to be happy about? You know, I'm I'm the best poker player in the world. Whereas with her, it was like her face just lit up. I still remember it. It was just so great. And it just shows how Annie wears her her heart on her sleeve. And I, I love that shit. So anyway, that's how I knew Annie. What I didn't know until I read her book, somebody uh, actually suggested her book to me a while ago, six months ago. Um, and I read it. And what I didn't know was she is just a, a incredibly intelligent person um, and uh, an incredibly educated person. She um, was maybe a month away from getting a PhD uh, in, in cognitive behavioral decision making, I guess you would call it. That sounds about right. Um, and she knows, and then she applied that type of thought process to, to playing poker and becoming a successful poker player. Um, and while I feel like I've always had sort of an instinctual feel for this type of behavioral stuff, as most people know, I'm really a behavioral person. I'm not looking at charts and fundamentals. I'm really fading mass sort of bad decision-making. Um, I've been pretty instinctual with that. Here's a person who is actually very well educated in this and can tell us these are like the real things. You know, I've read a few books. I've read the Kahneman book and I've done all that. But this is a person who really knows what the hell she's talking about with this. So, Annie, on that note, thank you for coming and welcome. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm excited for the conversation. Okay. And, you know, um, there are some interviews on, on YouTube and whatnot of Annie that people have done specifically about her book and her books. And I would certainly suggest that people should check those out and also read her books, because what I don't want to do here is have her explain to us what's in her books. What I'd like to do is kind of cut right to the chase and have her tell us how we can use these lessons about making better decisions um, to become better traders. Uh, So and then I have some questions that people sent us. But any on that note, how do we use these lessons to become better traders? Just take it (laughs) away. Right. Um, and I have specific questions. You want wait, me to so I, I just want to, I want to, I want to just like brag about something that I'm super proud of for myself. Please. Uh, Cause you mentioned that I quit graduate school way back when, like literally ABD, like I was on the job market and decided to go play poker. Right. I, in June, I successfully funded my dissertation and I am officially a PhD. Do- so now I'm sorry. We have Dr. Annie Duke on our show today. Now I'm and I'm only saying that because like I'm super proud that I went back 30 years later and actually like finished the thing. Good. You're like those NFL players that go back to school and get a degree. Right, right, exactly. When exactly. did you officially become uh, the doctor? I I successfully defended June 15th. My official degree date was August 4th. Okay. Of 2023. Well, just congrats. in case people are listening to this in the future, which I suppose they might. Hopefully. Congratulations. 
Yeah. So, so hit us. How do I become a better trader? How, how, how do I make that? How do I do this better? Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> you know, I say sort of broadly, uh, separate from investing, there's only two things that determine how your life turns out. One is luck, which you have no control over. And the other is the quality of the decisions that you make. And that's it. Th that's it. So what we really need to do in all aspects is really get a really serious focus on the quality of your decisions. And uh, what that means is thinking really deeply about what are the things that I can do in terms of my own decision process that are going to make my decisions better? Because, you know, people talk a lot about, I make my own luck. This is something that people say in investing, actually, I make my own luck. And it's not true. You can't make your own luck. It's impossible. You don't have any control over luck. What you can do is make decisions that change the probability of outcomes that you desire occurring. Uh, either for the worse, make those things lower, or for the better, make those things higher. And so what we're trying to do through this focus on decision uh, on the decision quality is to um, increase the probability of good decisions happening. And uh, you can only do that through two things. Uh, one is to um, change, to, to increase the knowledge that's being inputted into the decision itself. Uh, and there's different ways to do that. We can talk about that um, for sure. And the, the other is to put good process on top of it. Uh, and the reason is that when we think about the quality of the decisions and what they get addled by, uh, one is just bias. And we can broad, like there's all sorts of biases that I'm sure that people have heard about, you know, like some cost fallacy and confirmation bias and all these things. But what those really come down to is I want to feel like a consistent individual that makes good decisions and doesn't make mistakes. And if you kind of think about all the cognitive biases, like through that lens, uh, you actually capture a lot of the ways that our, our decisions go wrong. Uh, we can think about it as uh, trying to move our own self-narrative along as opposed to trying to be accurate in our decisions. So we want to really start to think about how can we expand the different points of view that we have, like inputting in, in, into our decisions? How do we uh, gather more knowledge and perspectives into our decisions? And then how do we put really good process around that, which not only debiases us and reduces noise in the decision process, but it also gives us a record. And this is really important investing that allows us to loop back and create a feedback loop where we can now look back at the decisions that we made in the past to actually examine the decision quality without sort of making it up. Oh my God. I couldn't agree with those things more. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it, I guess it, it, our conversation it, is done. No, it's beautiful. I mean, I think you, you talk about in terms of, okay, let's try to figure out how to make better decisions. Well, one way to do that with, with what we're doing is, is you can start to, if you do it right, start looking at the back testing your strategy, right? To see if it, 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 are you doing something that is just shit to begin with, or are you doing something that maybe has some, some value, right? And right. then what that does obviously is it helps to determine where your risk is and, and how to deal with that. Like you say, there's luck, you know, I, I look at, at like my trading, less than 50% of my trades make money. Right. And so I put a trade on and hey, something comes out the next day, whatever, some bomb blew up or some central bank did something that I wasn't expecting and, and I lose money. I, I can't control that. You know, I, I don't have a direct right. line to the central banks. Right. But it's all just a question of the risk reward of the decision. Right? And that's what sort of back testing I feel like can help. Um, as one way to do it, keeping a record, like you say, I mean, I distribute a newsletter now that was originally just my record for 22 years. Yeah. I wrote this for myself and I love it more than anything else because I get to go back and look at how wrong I was on so many things you know, and be like, okay, what was I thinking then? And, and look at me and stop thinking that you might have a chance of being right because, you know, the, the, here's a million reasons, here's a million times when you, you know, sometimes I'm right. That might've just been luck too, right? But Right. I, I love the wrong things more than anything else, right? Because that's where I, I remind myself that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So stop thinking I know what I'm talking about. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, I think uh I think what you said is um is everything. And then in terms of, you know, surrounding yourself and you talk about this in your book a lot, and it's gonna lead me into some personal questions about my personal questions, but um surrounding yourself with people that can help you to do this because trying to find your own biases is very tough, right? Whereas if you surround yourself, that will help you to yeah. people that can help you find your biases. 
I think there's a, so I think there's a few problems that we have with, with um, figuring out what the own, you know, our own gaps in, in our knowledge are with figuring out, are we overconfident? You know, are we trying to chase, you know, what we'd say, throw good money after bad, because we don't want to turn a paper loss into a realized loss, for example. Um, the problem is that we really can't see ourselves very well from the outside looking in, right? We're looking from the inside, looking out. And we can look at other people and see so very clearly that they're biased. Um, and But we don't see it in ourselves. So... I think there's a few things that really go wrong in trying to get to those other perspectives and trying to find out that that we're not thinking about things in the most accurate way possible. One is that we don't have a strong desire to do it. So who who wants to find out that the thing you believe is wrong? Right? I mean that that's a lot of pain in the short run. Of course to be a great investor you have to be hungry for that information. Uh, but mostly we want to believe is we're investing in the market between 2016 and 2021 that we're just geniuses because we made a lot of money. Yeah. Everyone's a genius in a bull market, right? So we don't actually want to find a different perspective, which is, well, do you know what beta was? Did you outperform beta? Right. Were there other things that you could do, even if you were generating alpha that would have allowed you to generate more? Uh, did you take on too risk, too much risk, too little? Right. You know, so and so forth. Like we actually we actually really aren't that hungry for the information because it's like we have a we have a uh, a win, a psychological win. And and who wants to give that win up? Uh, so that doesn't feel very good um, when we're really hungry to look for alternative explanations is actually when we lose. Because when we lose, that's very painful. And so we like to look at things like I couldn't have foreseen it. Um, so we love explanations like that when we, when things don't go well. But we have to be equally willing to, to look for those information. You know, sorry. We have to be equally willing to look for those explanations, regardless of whether we won or lost. And, and we're not naturally kind of wired that way. So I think that's problem number one. What falls out of problem number one is that we tend to speak in a way that reduces the opportunity for us to be wrong. And it also reduces the opportunity for people to actually disagree with it, us. So let me divide that into two categories. So when we say something like, this was an example from a podcast I just did, inflation, uh, we I believe inflation will be transient. What does transient mean? If if it's, if there's still inflation in a year, am I wrong? Right. Like because we you don't know what transient means. It depends. Everything's on the transient. You get enough Everything's time. Everything's transient. <laughs> right. So so I'm saying something that sounds very deep. Right. Uh, it's transient, and then we could throw in something like it's likely to be transient. Right. Yeah. So we hear we hear statements like that from pundits all the time. If you go and listen to CNBC, uh, right, yeah. you'll hear people making statements like this a lot. And the thing is, how can they possibly be wrong? No, yeah, that's right. Right. So so but but tell me the meeting that you've ever had where people aren't slinging around words like I think it's really likely or uh, this is going to happen more often than not. And I don't know what those things mean. Neither does the person like they have uh, definitions that are like really broad target areas. And what it allows you to do is that slippery slidey out of accountability for any outcome that might occur, because likely could mean anything. Right. So I think that there, uh, there's a lot of the way that we communicate that protects us from that blow to our self narrative that comes from being wrong because the words we're using kind of don't allow us to be wrong, if that makes sense. So I think, you know, that's one thing that falls out of that. The other thing that falls out of this, like, I don't want my self narrative to be pierced is that we tend to really love to seek other people's opinions after they've already heard our own. So I I'm not going to go to you and say, like, I don't know, I'll just pick a show that I've been watching lately, like uh, uh, Welcome to Wrexham. So I've been watching that show. I like it. Um, I'm not going to go to you and say, what do you think of that show? 
that's like weird and unnatural, right? I'm going to say, oh, I've really been enjoying this show. Like, I love Welcome to Wrexham. I think it's fun to follow the team. And da, da, da. like, what do you think of the show? And the fact is that when we do that, I'm not going to get a particularly good answer from you. And that that's true, whether we're talking about a TV show or an investment that we're thinking about or anything else, right? Like, how am I going to get a good answer from you when you already know my opinion? Because I put you in a very bad situation where uh, if you disagree with me, I'm now making you actually disagree with me, like to my face. So we tend to have conversations in groups because it makes it, the, it creates the appearance of more agreement than there actually is. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a humongous, you know, I think it's a humongous problem for decision quality. I can't remember what the second point I made was, but I'm sure we'll come back to it. But I mean, that right there, and there's just so many things that you say yeah. in every four sentences. I'm trying to take notes because I can. I wanted to ask so many questions on the topic, but that right there is a problem for me because I'm looking for mass consensus and I'm looking to fade mass consensus. So trying to develop mass consensus can be difficult because it's like you say, if I say to people, hey, I'm super bearish, what are you? Right. Well, then that's right. not helping me develop mass consensus. Right. It's helping me actually create mass consensus right, right. then me. then you're you're going to create false signal right and, so that, you know that's and i think it's just me. i think it's a very unnatural way to talk to people we want people to agree with e e us so we'll signal what we believe in advance we maybe we think that what we believe is actually really important data right right that that it's actual data but what if we're trying to get out of our own way right if we're trying to get to somebody else's opinion then I need, this is the key. I need to actually find out what you think, independent of what I think. Okay, so uh, one thing that's not going to help is to use words like likely. Because likely to me may, might mean 30% and likely to you may mean 60%. And right. we both agree that it's likely, but we actually really, really disagree with each other, right? So we have to stop using words like that. But the other thing is that we we really have to stop offering our opinion first. So like in a group setting, how do you do that? Uh, figure out what are the subjective judgments that you're trying to get from the group and then have them do those independently before you ever discuss them. Because now if you think about it, if I if I say, hold on a second, like I don't I'm not going to tell you what I think about. Welcome to Wrexham. I'm using obviously a silly example. Let's both take out a piece of paper and write down what we think of the show. The, you're not disagreeing with me now because you don't know what my opinion is. We may end up in a state of disagreement, which is good because then we find out we have something to talk about. Uh, or we may end up in a state of agreement, but I'm not forcing you to disagree with me because you don't know what I think first. And then I'm just going to get a much better opinion from you. Um, and that's actually going to allow me to get to what we would call the outside view, which is the world from outside of my own perspective. Uh, and we cannot be good decision makers without that. That is like the biggest key is I have to be able to see how other people in the world view the situation that I'm looking at, because the way that I view it is going to be biased. The way that somebody else views it is going to be biased as well, but it's going to be a different bias than my own. And that's really, and if I can get a bunch of different independent um, perspectives, I'm much more likely to find the truth in there. I love it. I mean, I, uh, without a doubt, have found, you know, what I have ended up doing is rely on certain data set. You know, like I say, if I'm trying to fade mass consensus, right? Well, I've relied on certain data sets that are independent of opinion. It's just data, right? That says, hey, this is where people are super long or this is where people are super short. Because I find clearly when I'm trying to find out whether people are super bullish or, or super bear or something, um, my bias of interpreting that data becomes bad. If I want to be bearish, then I can go around and say, oh, look at how bullish all these people are. Are they yep. really bullish or is that really just what I'm seeing? You know, right. and that has has hurt me in the past, right? Like I say, once in a while, it ends up being good, once in a while, it ends up being right, but it, it doesn't help me, right, overall. Right. So I, I, I tend to rely just on strictly on data, right? Which is not perfect data. I mean, trying to figure out the perfect data, as we know, is impossible. But I try to rely strictly on data rather than that thing because I know that my bias is going to get in the way of, of that thing, right? Yeah, I, I agree. And I would add on to that a caution. Please. Which is <laughs> that 
data is not truth. Data is an input into truth, into the way that you're supposed to model that data. And there's all sorts of ways that we can model data that will be, uh, that will, will support our bias. Yes. And make us actually much more confident in our conclusions than we would be if we didn't have the data. So look, I, I, I'm a huge fan of data. Every company that I consult for, uh, every firm that I consult for uh, has a data analyst. I work very closely with them. I'm a big fan of answering difficult questions with data. I think it's it's one of the things that I actually offer as a service. Um, but what I find is that it's it's hard you have to you have to be very careful about how how is it that you're looking at this data and interpreting it in a way that uh, leads you to a wrong conclusion and and generally to lead you to a conclusion that you're trying to get to. Yeah, um, bad, bad back testing. Right. So we can think about all sorts of different problems, right? Like uh, uh, the sample size is small. So you're actually looking at something that maybe we would want to label as a trend to watch, but we actually, it actually fits with what our narrative is. So in a case where it doesn't fit with our narrative, we'll say that's a trend to watch. But in a case where it does, we're like, look, the data says it's true, right? Uh, even though in both cases you have a small sample size. So that that might be something you might have like a sampling bias. Uh, the worst th- one of that would be like cherry picking data. But a- an example I'll give you, which was a real one uh, that happened was uh, there was a study that showed that uh, kids who ate breakfast did better in school. And so, of course, all the journalists are recommending that you feed your kids breakfast, they'll do better in school. Uh, but there was a sampling bias, which is that uh, rich kids each bre- eat breakfast right. uh, and they also do better in school, right? So uh, it, it's not it's not necessarily a causal relationship, but you can see why people started to do that because it was a story that made sense, right? But the Correlation is not causation, as they say, That right? is right. Correlation is not causation. So that would be like a sampling problem. Um People aren't good at looking for natural control groups. So uh, an example I would give of that is maybe um, uh, you're hiring people and you say, uh, gosh, you know, the top performers in the company that I've hired um, all seem to uh, score very high on on uh, conscientiousness on the big five or something, right? Uh, well, maybe so, but but that doesn't mean that you should hire specifically for that trait because you have to ask what about all the rest of the people who are quite bad. Um, so we would want to ask that question too, right? And I think that there's just a whole bunch of things that have to do with uh, wisdom around data where we just have to have this caution around it, which is data is amazing and it's in- it can really inform a decision, but there are cases where no data is better than data if you're interpreting the data to support your own bias, right? Because your confidence in your conclusion is going to be so much higher. Um, You're you're gathering data to get rid of your bias, but then the data that you're gathering, you're still using your bias to get to the conclusion. To interpret the data. That's exactly right. And I see, I look at, I see it all the time with people that I consult with where they'll come to me very excited with uh, data insights. And, and oftentimes I'm just poking a hole into the balloon and sort of deflating it right. uh, for the reason that it, this is so hard. These are very smart people. They're trying to find the truth. They're totally willing to be wrong. Um, but when the da- when you see something in the data that is supporting a belief that you already have, that is total, you know, stranger danger, right? Like, oh my gosh. And I think that we need to be, that's something that we need to build into our decision process is like a checklist of what are the things that we're asking about that are going to help us to understand whether this is truth or not. Um, And I don't think we're very good at it. Awesome. (laughs) I want to, um, I I do, we went out to our people and and asked them to give us some questions, but I'm going to be selfish first. Because okay. I need some deep therapy, and I think you can probably help me with it. I don't know. I'm not I, someone. I mean, you have to understand that, and you don't understand because you don't know me. But I am 100 all I do 
is take opposite sides of people. That's all okay. I do because I believe. I like so that you're betting against them. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. And, and because I believe so strongly in what you're talking about, that all these people have these behavioral okay. biases and therefore are leading to, to poor decisions. My chances of making money by going opposite them is better than anything else I could come up with that I could do. And that's yep. all I do because all I'm trying to do is make money. Right. Okay. So I come from just an incredibly almost dysfunctional place of that. Okay. Okay. Um, so like in your book, you talk about this person, um, the Greek, right. That played poker <laughs> with you and that lost money. Nick the Greek. Nick right. the Greek. And, and lost money consistently. Right. And from he what did. I could, from what I could tell, there were two reasons that he lost money consistently. One, his process was bad to begin with, right? Which True. you would know as a poker player that his process is flawed to begin with and is destined to, to lose money, right? And two, he never wanted to acknowledge that. Every time he lost money, it was because of bad luck. And every time he happened to make money, it was because of he, he was so smart and his process was so smart. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I would say the second thing is the more important one. Okay. So it was, it was so, it was so, uh, you know, this is what I said, right? When I said, like, if you think about a lot of the problems that we have as decision makers, they're driven from um, a desire to have a positive self narrative. So here's right. the problem if you lose a hand because you made bad decisions, that's not good for your <laughs> self narrative. Okay. Right. So, how do we actually deal with that, right? Like, I lost a hand. I don't want to believe I'm a bad decision maker. That would be really bad for my self narrative. So yes. therefore it must've been due to luck. Okay. But this is, that's going to be part two of my question. Okay. Part one of my question for completely selfish reasons. If you mm -hmm. recognize this in a person, okay, mm -hmm. here's a person that I, from everything that I know, and also from the proof of the data is going to lose money playing poker, Right. Why should I even play poker? Why can't I make a deal with the people on the table? Whatever this guy makes, I'll pay. And whatever he loses, you pay me. Would you make that deal? Oh, yeah. Can no, people get... do that all the time. It, they, You can do that. You can cross book. You can. Yeah. So and wouldn't that be a much easier way to make money playing poker rather than having, having to sit there and make all these difficult decisions and get into your own mind and spend all these hours? Just be like, look, I can recognize that this person has a sense. Sure. I mean, job. I think most people I think most people enjoy the process of playing. I mean, okay. I, I retired in 2012. But when right. I played poker, uh, I think it was fun to to um, it, it was definitely fun to play. But people did do that. So there were two different types of cross books. Um, one might be whatever this guy wins, I'll pay you. Mm -hmm. Whatever he loses, you pay me. But then you could also take the difference of one person's winnings versus losing. So that was a bigger bet, obviously. Long that you were making. Trade. There, yeah, there's more volatility there since you're betting both sides of it. Right. Um, but um, yeah, but but people would do that all the time. You could book somebody, you could cross book them. Uh, so oh. I could say, I could say, um, I'm going to take Josh against Annie. Right. And you have to pay me the difference. Right. As an example. So that's a pretty big bet. I could say, I'm just going to short Josh. Right. Whatever he loses, you know, you got. I you love know, that. I mean, that's essentially what me. I Whatever get. he wins, I have to pay you. Yeah. I mean, I understand that people enjoy the process. And I guess it's the same exact thing in trading. They enjoy the process of trading. So they do it. Right. Me, if I could just, I try, I, I can't, I don't have that option, but I try to do that. I try to find what they're doing and just cross book them, right? That's what I'm trying yeah. to do. Now, the yeah. problem is now I have to deal with my own bad psychology of, you know, my my own whatever and my own discipline to make sure that I'm cross booking them correctly, right? Um, but that's essentially what I do, right? So the other point, I, the problem I have with, with all this thinking is my next question on this is it's just like trading and it's just like poker. The, the people keep saying, oh, it's just bad luck when I lose, I'm smart when I win, but you have a PNL, right? Be it poker, be it People trading. are so good at ignoring that though. That's what amaz it just amazes me because you have a PNL. This isn't like opinions, right? Here it is. You talk about data. There's no lying in PNL data, right? You can make yeah. it and be like, oh, well, I made this so, month and okay, but yeah, after I mean, a I think long enough time. This yeah. is where accountability. So, so I think there. Uh, so this is such. That's such a good question. So we can, we can think about a couple of. We can think about a couple of problems here in terms of people's psychology in relation to PNLs. One thing is what what's the length of the feedback loop? 
Right. So the slower the capital, let's take venture, for example, the more that you can fool yourself into thinking you're great when you're not, right. because you know, you invested in Uber however long ago, and then all your whole portfolio isn't going to realize for like another 10 years. And so you right. can just be like, Howard Marks says, um, uh, it's filled with a bunch of people who've won one time in a row. Yes. Right. So, um, so, you know, I think that that's, you know, when you get into these very, very long feedback loop situations, particularly when there's power law involved, right. Where there's very, very few winners, uh, it's very easy to sort of ignore the PL and blame everything on luck and sort of take credit for good stuff and all of that, right? But even in something like poker, which has a really fast, fast feedback loop, um, in the end, you're only accountable to your own uh pocketbook. So it's very, you know, one thing that I found was people were really good at reporting their wins and forgetting their losses. So I would have people come up to me and be like, I win 95% of the time I play. And I'm thinking, do you, do you want to book that? Like, what are you talking about? Like, no, and you make a dollar those 95% and you lose a thousand the other 5%. So what good? Well, is- they also weren't winning 95% of right, the time of to play. Like that's completely impossible. Even of if you're course. playing really low vol poker, it's just not yeah. going to happen. No. So, but remember that their PL is private, right? So they they don't have to show it to anybody. Yeah, but it hurts. Um, not as much as feeling like you're bad at what you do. Really? That's what oh, I don't yeah. get. Like that's that's my problem right there. I have no problem being for whatever reason being wrong. I love it because that's where I learn, right? Yeah. Where I, I know, have a problem is losing money. People. I'm a money manager and it's not yeah. private because I manage money for other people, but so I that's where I'm gonna money. right. So that's the, so that's a big difference, right? So if we're talking about someone who's day trading for themselves or playing poker for themselves, yeah you can you can live in the 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 luck excuse for a really long time even as you're looking at your own pnl that might be losing it's so easy to say i'm just on a bad run yeah right like it's very it's like maybe I'm that bad run is 10 years but but you can say it gotta hurt um, man like you know what i mean i can't pay sure, my bills but it, anymore. again it doesn't hurt as well actually let me say this the reason why you can say i've been on a bad run for five years or what I've been on a bad run is because it hurts Yeah, because it hurts to lose because it so hurts us mechanism. to lose. Right now. So one of the, the, the cures, like if we're thinking about being a great, making ourselves a great investor, you have to create accountability. So why is it that if I, if I'm a, you know, an options trading firm of some sort, let's say I'm like, you know, Jane street or something. Um, if I have traders, the ones that don't do well get fired. So what does that mean? That the trader themselves is held accountable to their P and L in a way that's going to, I assume going to make them make money more, you know, if, you know, make them get better more quickly. Um, so if we can create accountability to the results, for ourselves, either because of the environment, like you're managing other people's money. Like now you have accountability. Yes. It makes it, it tethers you to reality in a way yes. that it otherwise, it, that it otherwise wouldn't. And I think that that's such an important piece of the process. So even if you're like a one man shop, right? First of all, find other people to bounce ideas off of where you're not actually, you're doing what I said, right? Let's take out a piece of paper and write down what we think before we say a word to each other. But find other people to help you out. Like I often uh, recommend that like solo portfolio managers pair up uh, because it's very helpful if they don't have a fully built out team. But also, but also you use those other people as an accountability mechanism, right? So maybe you're not in a situation where you're managing other people's money and you're and you're a solo trader. Fine, but be accountable to other people. Tell the you know tell them what. Uh, what the benchmarks are that you feel like you need to meet in order to feel to feel like this is what you should be doing is as, as opposed to say indexing, right? You must create accountability because accountability is what creates better decisions. It's like, this is the whole point of framing decisions as bets. If I say to you, I think it's a hundred percent that uh, Ukraine is going to win the war. Right. Right. Uh, and you say, Oh, do you want to bet on that? 
right? Now I'm like, oh, wait, hold on. Maybe they're not 100% to win the war. Maybe what I really mean is that they're 75% to win the war. And I'm saying it's 100% because that's the side I'm rooting for or whatever, right? So, So now I have to think about what does Josh know that I don't know? Like, why is he willing to be on the other side of this belief that I have where he's willing to put money to it? So, so that, that as soon as you say, do you want to bet? We've created an accountability mechanism that that's going to now discipline my belief and discipline my confidence and help me with this problem of allowing myself, for example, when I, when I'm losing for six months to believe that it's only luck. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that this sort of thing that we started here and we have this, uh, chat thing, you know, whatever it's called here, where all the guys, all the people that have joined can chat. That's what it's kind of become. It's become an Mm -hmm. accountability thing. I think that's what's helped people more than anything. And it's what's helped me more than anything else. All of a sudden I've got a thousand people on here. And we're I, holding you my, accountable. Yeah, they they read my newsletter and they're like, well, what the hell were you talking about with this? I thought right. you said this and now you got this, right? Right. So it's great because it, it helps hold me accountable and, and it helps them hold, hopefully get them accountable for their decision makings too. They got 800 people on there. They're going to throw things at them if they're, if they're thinking right. in a certain way. So it's funny how it's become that, um, but it's great because it sort of goes with exactly what you're saying. Um my next thing, and just by the way, in my amateur psychology, I do have a history of family of, of psychologists and psychiatrists, but in my amateur psychology, I'm a believer that one of the reasons people are willing to sit there, and, and even though their PNL is negative all the time, I, I never knew this, but I've learned it in the last five, 10 years of my life, or I believed it in the last five, 10 years of my life because I've witnessed it. There are a lot of people who actually maybe PNO is not their goal. Maybe sympathy is what their goal is. You know, sure. maybe, maybe mommy different... and daddy didn't yep. give them enough attention when they were growing up or whatever. And they're really just looking for sympathy. Absolutely. You know, I see it all the time. People get together and, you know, they talk about the, how they oh they all have on the same trade and it's losing money, but it's OK. We're all going to be OK because the big day is coming where this trade is going to make yep. us millions of dollars. Right. I see that all the time and it makes me sick and I, and I fade those people and I make money off of it. And that's, that's how I deal with it. But I, I see that behavioral all the time. And it, and it just, it's sad to me really. Yeah. It's sad. But yeah, so that's that. What I would like to ask you, I'm still on my own personal uh, psychology here and my own, my own personal uh, problems, but how do you deal with it? You have this knowledge. Okay of human beings and essentially their weaknesses, right? And why they are making mistakes, okay? You have this great knowledge of that and you've taken advantage of that by making money from it, okay? And now you're doing it a different way where you're trying to help them and that's great, but how do you go out into the world? You know what I mean? You got to go to Thanksgiving dinner and I know your family is probably close to you, but you got to go out to the PTA meeting or you got to go out, you got to deal with these people making these decisions all the time. And you know that the decisions that they're making are stupid and you know why, because you're educated, highly educated in this. And yet you can't get in their face and say, listen, I've got a PhD and what the decision reasons that you're making here is stupid. And this is why, because then they're just going to get mad at you and kick you out of the PTA. And that doesn't do anybody any good. This is the life that I live, by the way. How do you deal with it? You know, you have to, I think there's a couple of things. Yeah. You just have to pick your spots. You know what? One of the things that. Let, let me tell you, can, let me tell you a story from my time on Celebrity Apprentice to try to explain this. I know this is a very weird segue, but I no, think anything, I, anything, I please. think it will help. So. I think about different things that I'm doing as different games. And that doesn't mean like playing games with people. Like it's not a bad word. It's more like there are different rules. This is a different construct. I have different goals. uh, And my job is to play within the rules of whatever this situation is as best as I can. So when I was on, on Celebrity Apprentice, um, the first few uh, challenges are just like the team working together. And obviously you're trying to win the challenge so that you don't end up in the boardroom. And so I was quite vocal when I saw that people were making stupid decisions. 
Right. And I think that uh, some of the other contestants uh, found me pushy uh, to use a nice word <laughs> for oh, it. it. Um, because I would just be like, you d- d- ah, don't, you know, don't make that. Right. Decision that I know what you're doing right. wrong here. Listen to me. Yes. So let's fix it. So I think they found me um, uh, in some ways abrasive. So, um, but they also knew, they also knew uh, that I could, that I was raising a lot of money and like the charity component of it. I so so I'm a little bit of a threat here and they think I'm abrasive. Right. So, so we get to a, a challenge where we have to quote unquote run a hotel and the project manager who I think was really hoping that I could get voted off the Island, so to speak, um, voted out of Trump tower, uh, put me, so they had to assign roles for this, like, running the hotel thing. And some of those things were very customer facing. Uh, So I was assigned to be a bell person uh, and a room service person. And I think their thought was this woman is so abrasive and she's so like in your face, clearly she's going to be terrible at these two things and she, and the customers will hate her. And so then if we end up in the uh, boardroom, it will be really easy for me to get her off the show to, to have her get fired. But what she didn't understand is like my approach to things is like, what what am I, what is this game, right? So I was playing the bell person game, right. which is here's your closet. Is there anything I can do for you? Do you need to get anything? Like so on and so forth. With room service, it was, can I set this up? Where would you like this to be put? Like, oh, your, your eggs weren't right. Let me go and get those for you. Uh, because it was a totally different, the, the purpose of what I was doing was different. The goal of what I was doing was different. Different so, situation, you adapt to it. Exactly. So, so in that situation, I actually ended up being like I got named the star person on the team for that time. So, uh, it, it, the the tactic backfired. Um, but the reason is that I I'm not I'm not playing the same game every single time. Right. So so if if I'm playing the PTA game. I'm, I'm honestly, my PTA game is mostly, can you stop asking questions so that I can get home? But, um, you know, there's always people who keep asking questions and I'm like, no, we've already covered it. Can we no, I'm the same, but um, it's the same thing. It's, it's right. still the same. Then they get mad at you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, you know, it's a different, it's a different game that I'm playing. And again, I don't want to say that means like, I think that when you say that people think, oh, you're, you're messing you're, with people. Yeah. You're, you're messing you're with people or you're genius. manipulating people or, or whatever. Yeah. It's like, yeah. um, you know, it's like with my husband, we we have fights where sometimes I think that I'm right and I don't say it because right. I'm playing the the marriage game, which is uh, how important is it to me to be right? How important is it to him to be right? Does it really matter? Risk I should make sure that I'm keeping my capital for times that it really matters to me. And this yes. is going to make our long marriage, hopefully, um, yes. you know, much more harmonious. And I think that that's totally fine. And and that's part of good decision-making is to recognize what your goals are. Right. No, I, I think for me, what the best thing you said there was the very beginning, pick your spots. That's the lesson yeah. that I have to learn. Just pick your spots. Because I get into fights with people about stuff like this. And where afterwards you're like, why did I do that? Like, I- I'm like, why did I even bother? It's not going to yeah. change their mind. You know, my wife says it to me all the time. We'll go to Christmas dinner and I'll, I'll end up causing everybody to cry. Right. Right. And she's like, and why? It's like, what's the point? Yeah, she's like, why? I'm like, I'm trying to help them, honey. She's like, they don't want your freaking help. You can't help right. somebody that doesn't want your help. Okay, so just shut up, eat the turkey, and go home. So I've I've actually <laughs> done this before when, you know, so your point about some people just want sympathy. I, I think that that is so insightful and so true. And so I'll be talking to people who are who are, you know, complaining about stuff and whatever. And I'll I I have been known to do this often. I will stop them and I will say, I just need to understand, are you just looking for emotional support here or do you want my opinion and advice? Because okay. I just need to know so that, be like, Whoa. <laughs> so that I, I know what I'm doing here. Now, <laughs> th- they'll usually, sometimes they say I want my advice, but then I figure out they don't really. They like, don't, no. th- then you test it with a very light piece of advice. You're right. like, so what did, would you think about this? And as soon as they rebuff you, you go, no, they just want emotional support. So you have the advantage over me with this because you have, I hate to be sexist, but you have the woman's touch. I yeah. So I, I just mean? say, I'm <laughs> like, I just need to understand, like, do you want to just bend my ear? Which is totally fine. Like, um, I'm happy right. to listen to what's going on. Or do you actually, do you want my advice? Right. And um, it helps me to establish 
what are the ground rules here? Like, am I playing the sympathetic friend game, right. which I'm happy to be? I'm actually right. sympathetic to you. You're sad. Right. Um, or am I playing the advice giving friend? Right. Um, and so that's why, like, at Christmas dinner, I, I, I would never be saying to somebody, like, you're completely wrong about this, right? Like, unless it was something really existential. Look, if it's something that if if they're saying something that I find abhorrent, I will I might say something. But um, but mostly I'm kind of, you know, I'm I'm sort of like, what's the point? Yeah. I mean, the sad part about the fights that I have with that is it's not even something I have a strong opinion of because what I have drained myself to do is not have a strong opinion on anything. So really all I'm doing is taking the opposite side of what you're saying just to make you see that there is another side to the story. Okay. Right. That pisses people off. So, some of that, though, I, I will say some of that I think is cultural. So you're describing my dinner table when I was growing up, but we were all bought into that. No, and I, I've actually said that too. I mean, my wife was raised in an Irish Catholic family. Okay. In, in New England. You know what I mean? They don't do yeah. that. I was raised no. in a Jewish family in New right. Jersey. We had so Thanksgiving say, dinner. Yeah, if everybody so, wasn't completely hating each other and fighting by the end of the dinner, then we didn't know what the hell we were doing, right? Right. So exactly. I've actually said that. I'm like, look, honey, you know, this is what it is. You don't invite a Jew to Christmas dinner. <laughs> well, well, this is that's the thing. So I, I will say that that's that's true. Like, uh, and there's even cultures within families. So uh, my dinner table was like yours. If we didn't end up in some knockdown drag drag out fight about like geopolitical events, right. uh, it was a weird dinner, right. um, and it was all fine. Um, right. Uh, but not not all families are like that, right? No, so right. not all dinners are like that. A yes. lot of them are just trying to have small talk, or it's like where it's like Downton Abbey, and nobody's ever saying anything controversial. No, that's right. That's um, right. You know, and that that teach his own. I happen to prefer the former when everybody's bought into the debate, but uh, I yeah. I don't think that happens all the time. So no, but this is the thing that I have to. I'm already 56, but I have to grow up and realize it just because that's what I prefer, and that's what so it doesn't mean that that's what everybody prefers, and therefore I don't need to ruin Christmas dinner, right? So now I just shut up. Okay, I try to go. shut up. But, you know, it's funny because what I find is as Mr. Contrarian, right, I am by definition against what everybody is thinking. So and, and this is why I work for myself, because what I okay. found was forget about the P&L, right? It's one thing. You're Mr. Contrarian. You're wrong. Oh, well, you're, whatever. You're wrong. You lost some money. The worst thing that happens to me is when I'm Mr. Contrarian and I'm right and I make money. Because people then get people, mad at you. Then people just get pissed at me. It makes them look yeah. stupid. It's yeah. like, dude, I just made you money. This is what you hired me to do. I just made money because of that. But it just makes them look stupid and them feel yep. threatened. And then, you know, this is why I, I, I stopped working for hedge funds and went to work for myself because it became about that. And, and I, I can't yep. deal with that, you know? So yep. it, it, it's a strange thing. Does it frustrate you as it frustrates me to watch people successfully sell into this weakness of human beings so in other words there's a bunch of people that will sell into these behavioral weaknesses and make a bunch of money by taking advantage of that right does that frustrate you like it frustrates me um or just accept it and say that's what people are uh i don't know i'm trying to think about how to interpret the question um so this whole thing of you know the, it the, doesn't the, frustrate the, me when people are trading against somebody's bad decision making okay so that's not frustrating to me because that's actually the definition of poker right if you're yes. good at poker you're trade. that's what you do right you're trading yes. against people's bad yes. decision making yes what i find i don't know if the word is frustrating um disheartening, disheartening. aggravating aggravating sometimes makes me rage is I mean, like I see these people that sell, you know, it's like all the right. things that when people, people are about selling that people it, want yeah. to do. They don't want to be responsible for their own decision making. They want people. To, so people sell them these like trading signals and all. And I yes. know it's crap. OK, of course, but it's these crap. people make millions otherwise, of dollars. Otherwise, they wouldn't be selling it. They would be yeah. trading it. No, of course. So, so yeah. Well, and I see this in politics a lot, too. You know, yes. like just just the the completely like the taking advantage of the of the weaknesses in in human cognition in a way where you know that what you're selling is crap yes. that that it's i don't get frustrated by that that makes it just it it makes me angry because i think it's immoral it um, pisses me off if you and, and you know and it's immoral and i'm not judging how somebody makes their money people make their money how they want to make their money okay right i get it but it, it really does piss but me if off you know me. if you know that what you're selling is a lie look there's all sorts of different versions of snake oil salesmen Yes. And the reason why snake oil salesmen worked really well is because people wanted to believe that there were cures for things that there weren't cures for. Yes. And so 
people who knew damn well that they were selling them a bottle of water or whatever yes. the equivalent of that was, um, we're giving, you know, we're giving this to people in a way, you know, where they, you know, I'm sure there was a placebo effect, but um, yeah. it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to cure the thing that they thought it was going to cure. And it was really playing into uh, what people wanted to believe to be true. And it's I mean, not I would find the people that are snake oil salesmen end up convincing themselves that the snake oil is actually real. Some of them, I, I believe that some of them do that. They even believe yeah, it themselves. They I believe their own probably, bullshit. I think that's probably true, but I think probably less true. I think I think yeah. when you're getting into the people who are selling like the trading signals and things like that, they know it's not true because otherwise they'd be trading them. Well, they say they are and they make up false statistics because they, they don't get audits. They make up them. all these false statistics. And even if they are real statistics, I make money 85% of my trades. It's because they're really just, they're really just taking losing trades and adding to them all the way down, which you could right. never do in real life, but on paper you could, right? right? And then they bounce a little bit back and now you're even and you get out at an even trade, right? right. But you right. could never do that in real life because there's not an unlimited amount of capital. Right? Right. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. It pisses me off. It makes me want to be Harry Houdini, who we know, you know, in, in the last part of his life, he just went around the world trying to expose scams. He was the ultimate scammer being a magician. So he knew what scams looked well, but like. See, the, the, but it's different though. Not so, a scammer, is, but he actually, was the ultimate. This is, this is a good, this is a really good point. Um, and it's what aggravates me about snake oil salesmen is that when you're doing magic, as Harry Houdini was. Right. You're not saying it's real. You, you are not saying it's real. Right. You are saying, I am going to fool you. And it's going to be amazing because you will not believe your eyes, but this is not true. Right. Uh, I'm fooling you. Yes. A medium is telling you that you're talking to the dead. Right. Right. I mean, so, so they, they are doing magic, um, but they're selling it as the truth. And yes. that's the thing that's so awful. That's what Harry Houdini was trying to expose. Yes. You know, I really love like Penn and Teller, um, do an well, act. So, nice. um, they do, you know, in their act, they do things where they're exposing mentalism, for example, right. Where right. look, John Edwards can go into a room and be like, I'm feeling an R, you know, this kind yes. of stuff. And people really think he's talking to the dead and, and Penn and Teller spend a lot of time, like really debunking that kind of stuff. They do. So, uh, they have, I know they do a trick where, you know, it's like there's a sentence in an envelope and then some, you know, people are grabbing things from under their chair and lo and behold, that thing is in the envelope. Right. And they say, we're fooling you. Yes. It's not true because right. it is so aggravating when people take something that's an art um, and try to sell it as reality. Um, so that that's what that when you ask me, like, is it frustrating to you? That's the thing that's really frustrating to me is people who are taking advantage of this stuff. Yes. I mean, I don't want to get too into it because I know people get a little bit, you know, about this stuff. But to me, religion, you know I mean, the people who you want to be, be religious. I have, I have many good friends who are very religious, but these people who make tons of money off of it. It just to me, it's a, it's the grossest thing there is and politics for that matter. Right. Which, in my view, I don't want to get into it, but that's what this is all freaking about is these people making money by getting people to buy into their politic and religious bullshit so that they can all get rich. But anyway. Well, I mean, and I think, I think, you know, <laughs> it's possible to make a distinction between uh, people who are like healers. Yeah. Right. You know, where they're bringing people on stage and like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Or diabetes is cured. Throat right. 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 No, it's sick. Um, That kind of stuff. And it's sort it's of sick. what we think of as run of the mill. Sick. So I know we don't have all the time in the world. I promise these people I would, I would try okay. to get you some questions from them. I also, they, I just want you to know, this is not me, okay? They gave me a bunch of questions. I asked them, everyone to vote on which one should be asked first. Okay. Let's and so it. I have a list. And of course, I would have gone the complete opposite way, A. And B, the first questions are by far the silliest questions. Okay. And probably the most entertaining. So if it's okay with you, I will ask you. Okay, those. we'll see. I don't, don't know if I'm entertaining. And don't answer them if you don't want to. But the first okay. one comes down to, is Phil Helmuth really that much of an asshole? Or does he just act like that to get airtime? That's a little bit of a complicated question. <laughs> um, Phil is what you see on TV. Yes. But uh, you know how they're like, so, sort of to the point of they're, uh, is he, is, does he have a good heart? Like, does he have good intention? Right. And the answer is yes. 
Okay. So what I would say is, as with anything, in poker, there are people who you see act much more politely, uh, but they're actually assholes. Like, they, right. they don't have good intentions. Right. Bill, ha- Bill has very, very good intentions. He just, his inner monologue is his outer monologue. Right. And personally, for me, those are the people that I like the most in the world. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, what you see is what you get with him. Like, Donald Trump, you know, politics aside, you know, and personality aside, the one thing I did like about his politics was... He's an asshole and he's not pretending to be anything else. Okay. And if you're voting for him, you know, you're voting for an asshole. You know, <laughs> whereas these other people I feel like are hiding the fact that they're a bunch of selfish assholes. Right. Anyway, I don't want to get into politics. <laughs> and for the record, I don't vote for Donald Trump, but that was the one thing I did like about him. You know, um, two, do most of these poker players actually have any money? It strikes me that many of them are gambling addicts, which can't be good. It reminds me of traders who overtrade just to have the thrill. It's very bad for PNL over time. Again, so let me just say I retired in 2012. So whatever I'm saying right. about poker is 11 years out of date. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. want to be very clear about that. Mm-hmm. Look, poker is like anything else. The top percentage win. Right. So yes, the majority of people that you play, pay, see playing poker are losing. Um, like long time, long run losing. Right. Uh, I think, you know, the number, I think it's like 5% of people who play poker make money. And then the number of people who are making a real living from it is obviously much smaller than that, right. which is true of anything. Right. I mean, yes. that, that would be true of any, any trading environment. So poker is hundred percent. But I mean, people like from some of the stories that you tell in the books, even right. Okay, these people are good poker players and they're making money playing poker, but they gamble on everything, right? Because they love it. Yeah, they, no, love, they love the so game. I, I was and thinking about just poker. There, there's lots of people who, who play poker who are broke because they're doing other things besides poker. That's what I mean. Um, For sure. Uh, and then there's a lot of people who you see who you think are big winners at poker, but they're actually not winners at poker. Right. Um. So that is also true. So you get a lot of those, you know, different combinations of that. But there there just isn't anyone who's playing a lot of house games. By house games, I mean uh, anything that's out on the floor of the casino. Right. They're called house games for a reason because the house is always going to win. Right. There isn't anybody doing those things that's going to, that you know, you can't fade back around. No, that's right. You can't. I mean. Yeah, it just struck me as, you know, I've seen, I don't want to get into the names because I don't know them and I just see them on TV, but it seems like they might be good poker players and they might make money out of poker, but the same personality, they're going out and playing, you know, $150,000 golf games and they're going and bet like me. Sure. I, I do what I do. Now, now to be fair, some of those people are very good at betting golf. So okay, some maybe. of them are because that's a skill game, right? So that's not a house game. Right. So there are some people who are losing money playing golf, but there's some great poker players who made a lot of money betting golf right. because just like anything else, that's just a market. You could be a very bad golfer and you can right. make lots of money. And still make betting. money. Because if you just, if you negotiate the right number of strokes aside. Of course, like, right. It's all about that, right? It's all yeah, about the odds. Exactly. Like, just like in the market, it's all about what's discounted in, right? Yeah. Everybody wants to decide what the recession is going to be. But the question is, what, the real question is, what's discounted in and how to measure that? Right. right? Um, okay. Because like for me, I, okay, I trade and that's fine. And, and, and to this point in my life, I, I've done a good job of it. But like, I don't bet football. I don't go to the casino. I don't do anything. I don't even spend money for that matter because I'm always so worried about it. Right. But that was an interesting question. Um, The rest of them, I think we, for the most part covered uh, cognitive biases and trading and all that. I I think we pretty much covered everything. So um, unless there's something else you can tell us, you know, my my two phrases, by the way, that I use the most here, like this is my one phrase. Don't trade fade. There you go. Which means I don't try to trade. I just try to, Make markets hey, to people yeah. that are. Um, and my other one is, you know, be wrong, make money, right? Yeah. I don't care if I'm wrong. I just want to make money. And I think that that's what people, as you say, are have a problem with, right? So, well, I, I mean, that's, you know, they'd I rather be mean, right and lose money than be wrong and make money, is what we're finding out. Yeah. You, you know, look, it, if you're, if you're going to be good at anything, whether it's poker or trading, uh, that has as much uncertainty in the environment, as much volatility, you have to get really comfortable with losing. And then uh, there are certain trading strategies, obviously, that where you have to be even more uncomfortable with losing. Because if you're trading the tails, for example, right. um, you know, you're going to you're going to be losing a lot, uh, yes. you know. Um, so it depends on your strategy, um, yes. what you're doing. But 
look, if you're, if you're playing a strategy where you, you're going to win the majority of the time, you're probably doing something very close to indexing. So then you're not really trading anyway. You're fooling yourselves and yourself into thinking that you're doing, you're doing something genius when you could actually free up a lot of your time and just go get some, you know, so get in a Vanguard. Um, no, that's, a, that's but, an excellent point. Right? That's an excellent like, point. I mean, that's the only, that that's the only way. Um, yes. So, you know. I love it. Yeah. Dr. Annie Duke, it has been an incredible pleasure. And again, I am very thankful. I know that you can spend a lot of time with a lot more high powered people than me oh, and God. probably make a lot more money with your time than, than sitting here and chatting with me and giving me some uh, psychological help. But I very <laughs> much appreciate it. Um, I really do. And I, I'm going to read uh, again, people out there. You, you, if you have any care about this, any care about not only making more money trading, but any care about how to start to get your decision making in your life better, you, you, you got to read this book here. I, have, I keep it right here on my desk. It's not just on my desk oh, because I'm doing this interview. Okay. It's because I've been I've been referring to this thing almost on a daily basis. Right? Well, thank you. Thinking in bets. And I believe Annie also wrote another book that I did not get yet. Um, but I'm going to get, what's the, the second book called again? Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. Also, Quit, I love it. Away. Quit. She writes a whole book about why the whole thought about quitting that everybody has is wrong. And in fact, quitting a lot of times can be the absolute right thing to do. Right? Yeah, the, the, the thing about that book also is uh, it's incredibly relevant to traders. Yes. Because uh, people are much better on the entry than the exit. Yes, no, so, I listened to one little thing about it that you did uh, on YouTube last night. And to me, you could change the name of that book from quit to stop loss. Yes, exactly. It's the same exactly. exact so, thing, right? I want it to be a little bit more in the in your face with the title, but uh, it's something that investors really, really ought to be reading for themselves because um, we pay so much attention to the entry. In yes. fact, we'll like create shadow books and, you know, so on and so forth, like, really trying to think so hard about the entry and we don't think at all about the exit. You tell me someone who has a, an exit shadow book, you know, there it's, <laughs> it, yeah, well, so that's rare. Yeah. Um, you know, people aren't looking at what, you know, given, given that I sold, like what are all the combinations of what I could have sold out of my portfolio? Uh, how would it have performed in these alternative, you know, decision spaces? Um, you know, so on and so forth, because you're, you're just not tra naturally tracking the exits. And there's just uh, a whole host of cognitive biases that pile on top of you that make it really, really hard to exit things anyway. So yes. the simple thing is, look, if we were perfectly rational, not taking into account um, fees, right, what the cost of trading is, right. but if we were perfectly rational, we would make the exact same decision about whether to hold something as we would about whether we would buy it that day, if we're sure. perfectly rational. But we For know sure. that the the chasm between what we do with something we already own versus what we would do if we were considering it fresh is like, you know, you could fall into a crevasse, you know, climbing Mount Everest, how big that chasm is. Yes. So the, the book is about trying to bring together those decisions so so that they look more similar. I love it. And, and, and I, I feel like all these things go right back to really what I try to get people to focus on, which is not, hey, what does Jason Shapiro think the market's going to do, right? I try to get people to focus on process, 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 discipline, risk management, process, discipline, risk management. That's it. Yeah. That's all this is, right? You yeah. can think that Jason Shapiro is some market guru and follow all his trades and a, you're going to be wrong, and B, there's a good chance that if it does work, Jason Shapiro might make money out of it, and you might lose money out of it because it's right. all discipline, process, right? right? And I think that's the, the similar message to what you're saying about pretty much everything. Yep. So I love it. I love it, and I hope that at some point I get to speak with you again because I, I just have – I'm not trying to blow smoke here. I have an incredible amount of admiration for, for what you're doing here and oh, the messages okay. that you're giving me because it helps me formalize – what has always been my belief system anyway. And, yeah. and it also helps me feel better because clearly 99% of the people out there are always telling me that my belief system is, is you know, ridiculous, which I don't care because my PL tells me the story, whether it is or it isn't, but it just does make me feel warm and fuzzy that I have an incredibly successful and incredibly intelligent person here telling me that it's okay, Jason, maybe you're not that crazy. So <laughs> okay. thank you very much.
All right. Thank you. And we you. hope to speak to you some other time. All right. Awesome. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. So I just wanted to do a little bit of a uh, sort of a post-game analysis of this Annie Duke interview because there was so much information in there, I thought. Um, and, and I'm just looking at from in terms of like what I'm taking out of it, right? And the main thing that really struck a chord with me was um, I think somewhere around the 19 and a half minute mark. Um, she talked about uh, data and how she's all for data, um, <clears throat> but it can be dangerous as well because it's just like anything else. You can have bias in your data and you can force it to tell the story that you want it to tell um, rather than let it tell the actual story, right? Um, and that can be very dangerous because if you then believe that, you are relying on that and you're relying on data that may not be any good. Um, and that struck a chord with me because <clears throat> as people know, in my trading system, I use the, the commitments of traders data very extensively. And I have taken that data and through back testing, I have created an oscillator um, uh, for, for the look back period uh, of that oscillator has been back tested. And, and, um, and one thing that I know from the back testing is that oscillator can be very unstable over time in terms of here sometimes during this period it works as a 90 day look back and this period it works on a 250 day look back. And so what are you going to use, right? And I have always chosen to just keep it steady um, from where I originally put these oscillators which was I, I tried to put them where the best pnls were bunched rather than pick some outlier best pnl because i know that's stupid but where it was bunched but um I, i've always known that that's sort of where the weakness in my process is and i have always in a way justified that um by thinking well i'm putting an extra layer on top of that because i'm not just buying when this oscillator says things or people are too short I'm waiting for a market confirmation in the forms of, of news failure before I actually execute it. And um, and that's bias right there, right? I, I'm, I'm making myself believe this. Now, in fairness, my PL has told the story and it's worked, okay? And even though I set these, 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 these look back periods a long time ago, you're talking about over 15 years ago, and they might not be that stable. Um, I have seen no degradation in my, is that the right word? Degradation in my returns over that time period. So this is why I haven't really looked to change it, right? But, you know, a Annie Duke made, made a lot of good points about just because something might be working, the question is, could it be working better? Are you missing out on better opportunities because of what you're doing, right? That's also a question. So all these things got in my head. Um, and what I did was uh, this afternoon, I got on the phone with the guy who does my quant work. Um, and we're going to take a, a whole relook at this whole thing with, with the CEO and the and the look back periods and are there more efficient ways that we can use this and because Annie really set this in my head that you know it can be done better you know and it just and the data can fool you sometimes so that's the first thing I took away from this interview for me um, the second thing which is just kind of silly is that while I love what she has to say and I think it's genius. You have to then question, do I think that because I agree with it? I mean, it's that whole confirmation bias circle, right? Um, is what she's saying really great? And is what she's saying really genius? Or is it just that I, I believe in the stuff that she's talking about? I believed in it before I talked to her. And this just kind of gives me confirmation bias towards that. So it's kind of a little funny. But um, again, it doesn't matter that much to me because my whole thing is I measure myself based on PL. And I do that a lot. And I look at my PL a lot, and I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it's falling within expectations when I go into a, some kind of losing period. Is it a normal losing period, right? Is it an expected losing period based on I don't have to just do back tests because I've been managing money this way for a long time. I can look at over 20 years of data and see it falling outside of that, that, that expected range of returns. Um, but I, I just think it's kind of funny that the, the circle that all this, you know, biasness goes into, right? It's just like she talked about, you want to take away bias so you look at data, but then you can use the data and you can be biased anyway. It's a very weird thing. But anyway, something to think about. I, I hope everybody enjoyed that interview. I hope everybody learned something from that interview. I think, like for me, I picked up that whole thing about, uh, it, it just clicked with me, the whole thing about the data and that you can be doing something wrong with it or that you can be doing something something better with it that you might be missing, even if what you're doing is working. Um, but I think there's something for everybody in there, no matter where you are in your journey with trading, no matter how you trade, if you're a systems trader, if you're a discretionary trader, whatever you are, um, I think there's something to be learned from everyone in there personally. So again, hope you enjoyed it and we will uh, talk again very soon. Thank you. Subscribe to Crowded Market Report by Jason Shapiro. 